Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Friday Night Live, 97th episode. I hope everyone is doing well. I have been absent for the past two months. I um, was traveling, and uh, it's great to be back in the United States of America. The, uh, the, and uh, alhamdulillah, everything is well. I definitely missed Friday Night Live. I would tune in from uh, Pakistan uh, and watch the guest that would come on and Mufti Abdul Wahab, who did a great job. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for the istiqama, the consistency uh, of the Friday Night Live. And it's something that, you know, you as an organizer like Mufti Abdul Wahab, he has to take out his Friday. Friday is a very busy day. It's the beginning of the weekend. And there are a lot of invitations, a lot of programs, a lot of travels. And mashallah, Mufti Abdul Wahab kept it going. So I feel, um, I feel, I feel uh, horrible that I wasn't there for him. But I also feel like, you know, I really want you guys to have a break from me. So I'm happy to be back. I hope everyone is well. Um, I, I definitely missed everyone. That's I say this without a. Uh, shadow of doubt, I miss the whole experience coming online, seeing your comments, people joining in from all across the United States, America, and all across the world. So welcome, everybody. Um, how is everyone doing? How is your summer? Where are you guys joining us from? And uh, how, is, how is life? I just feel like I've been totally disconnected. We have a community online. It's like a family. And that joins us on Friday Night Live. You know almost everything about me, and I know a lot about you. I know your name. I see it on the screen. I know what you, how you talk, and some people, I get to recognize the naughty people very quickly. And um, so my, my, my travel was, in summary, I went to Pakistan. I spent some time in Khuruj and Da'wa Tabligh. Um, I got to see the scholars in um, Karachi. I was there for 10, 15 days after Eid al-Adha. And then I have uh, my relatives, my family, and in-laws in Lahore. So I flew into Lahore, stayed in Lahore, then stayed in Karachi, came back to Lahore. And in the middle of all of this, I did fly back to the United States. I came back to Seattle for an event with uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. Um, they had me come in. So I flew from Lahore to Qatar, stopped there for two hours, from Doha to Seattle, stayed there for 72 hours, Flew right back to Lahore. That was um, that was uh, not an easy experience. I don't know if I ever ever do that again, except for maybe my wife and my children, my mom, and my dad. But um, that's what happened in the middle. But overall, you know, Pakistan was great. Mangoes season, uh, beautiful Muslims. You know, going to a Muslim country, everything is great about it. Muslims, except you know, they need some more resources. They're not some. They need a lot of more, a lot of help. If I had $10 billion, I would lend them a couple billion. They need some financial support. But overall, they have the Iman, they have the Muslims, which is the most valuable thing to, to the community, to, to, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, their, their infrastructure might not be as solid as the states, but definitely the people of Iman have a higher status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easy for them there and to preserve their Iman and give us also the strength to follow our principles in this country, especially in the West. So I see uh, some Muhammadi are joining us from Richmond, Texas. I saw some people joining us from Alberta, Canada, Canada. Is this Calgary, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta? You're joining us. Where are you joining us from? Um, then we have people joining us from, I see Toronto. From Qatar, exact Qatar, good, good, good. You know, um, Qatar, good, good, good. Mashallah. What else is going on, guys? You guys got to talk to me. Canton, New Jersey, welcome. Inshallah, we have um, Sheikh uh, Ustad uh, Mabruk. He will he will start the recitation. I see Netherlands here. As he's in Dallas. And welcome, welcome. I'm gonna invite Sheikh Ahmed Mabruk to the screen. He's an Imam, uh, a beautiful reciter. He uh, helps lead the salah and uh, Taraweeh with Sheikh Imam Muhammad Masmari in the same Unity Center. I'm very close to Imam Masmari and also dear friends with Sheikh Ahmed Mabruk. Great people, 
and Michigan is very fortunate to have Sheikh Ahmed Mabrouk uh, Qari, beautiful recitation. He will be joining us now, and I can ask Sheikh Ahmed if you can please. Ahlan wa sahlan. I'm going to wait for him to turn the screen on. Excellent. Uh, in the meantime, guess who's here? We have uh, Sheikh Muhammad Shinawi joining us. Also, can you put the camera a little bit towards Sheikh? There he is. There he is. You know, what the problem is when you bring the Sheikh in, all the light, all the spotlight, about? all Look the lens this, man. <laughs> goes there. Sheikh Ahmed, how are you? Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing? How are you, Sheikh Abdullah? Alhamdulillah. You know. How are you, Sheikh Muhammad? Long time no seen. The honor and pleasure is ours, Sheikh. He was in your masjid for Jummah. What do you mean long time no seen? Yeah, about two or three hours. I missed him already. Allahu Akbar. Kaad, kaad a zawjati yaftakaduni hakada. I wish my wife missed me like that. You just two hours and you miss him already. This is some serious Sheikh love. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. I love him. He's in my heart all the time. Allah, well, you have a big heart. Make some as, space for me. As same as you. Alhamdulillah. This is your heart. You have a big heart, Ustad. Alhamdulillah. Ustad, we're going to have you recite, inshallah, and bless us. And inshallah, then we, uh, Ustad, <coughs> um, now we will join us for the discussion, inshallah. Bismillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء عسى أن خيرا منهن ولا تلمزوا ولا تنابزوا بلا القاب ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا القاب 
وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِلَا الْقَابِ بِيسَ لِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ لِيمَانِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبَ فَأُولَا Ya ayyuhallazina amanu la yasqab qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran ولا نساء من نساء نساء أن يكون خير ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بلا القاب ولا تنابزوا بلا القاب بيس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن لم يتب فأولئك هم الظالمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثم ولا تجسسوا ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا يحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه أيحب أحدكم
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah wa khaira. Ustad Ahmed Qari Ahmed Mabru. Jazakum Allah wa khair. Wa jazakum wa akramakum barakallahu fikum. But just one second. Uh, the recitation was with the riwayat warsha and Imam Nafi'. Barakallahu fikum. Not half the house that we know. So, Ustad, when are we going to see you more? We need to see you in Miftah at the main campus. You're busy in Bloomfield. I am I'm here all the time, Sheikh Abdullah. Khalas, we'll, we'll come there. Jazakumullah khairan, inshallah. Akramakullah, Ustad. Jazakumullah khairan. Salam alaikum. Nafa'allahu bikum. Everybody, please say Jazakumullah khair to Ustad Qari Mabrook for his beautiful recitation. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khairan. Allah ibn alaikum. Akramakumullah. Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate to have. Uh, Qadi uh, Ustad Sheikh Ahmed Mabrook recite for us. And uh, he's a local resident um, teacher of the Quran, uh, leads the prayers, Taraweeh, and uh, Muslim Unity Center. So, Michigan is very fortunate to have him. Jazakumullah khaira. And tonight, uh, my guest, who is usually on the other side of the world or a different state, and if he was in his local state today, he would be in Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Sheikh Muhammad Shinawi, uh, Imam in Allentown, Pennsylvania, a researcher, director, Imam, teacher, and at the same time, great contributor to great articles and research papers, especially the proofs of prophethood with the Yaqeen Institute. And it, this is a privilege, honestly, Imam, to have you with us. And so, Jazakumullah khair, I want to welcome you. Guys, please welcome uh, Sheikh Muhammad Shinawi. He can see your comments, and trust me, when he reads your comments, he gets very excited, more than I do. So, you know, you guys um, should please let him know that you guys are excited about his 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 presence with us. Uh, Sheikh, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, very well. How, how was your drive? You drove all the way from Pennsylvania. What was yeah. How was this road trip all about? Longest road trip I've ever taken, alhamdulillah. Uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, it was very long. It was a few different weekends uh, in different Muslim communities learning from the experience. But, yeah, I went down to Raleigh and then Memphis, alhamdulillah, and then drove up to Detroit now. 
on our way home. So you went to Memphis? Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, okay. Then Memphis community, Tennessee, and then through Chicago to you guys in Detroit. Oh, you went to Chicago? Yeah. yeah. So you left, when did you leave Pennsylvania? About two weeks ago. So you've been on the road for two weeks? Yeah, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. And this is, the, the, the sheikh, I don't know if it's difficult for you, but you're with your wife and children, and I, your wife is... Is that a good friend. thing or a challenge? I think it's a great thing, you know? Uh, I mean, traveling with the family, they get to see they get to see the cities that you're I'm just visiting. trying to get you in trouble. <laughs> no, you know what someone told me? Sometimes people say that a lot of times uh, spouses don't know what the husbands are doing when they travel, you know? And sometimes when they do travel with us, they get to realize how busy we are. Like, it's not easy. Like, you just finished a two, three hour class on the beautiful topic of uh, how to speak up and when to not to speak up from the story of Suleiman and Salam and at Miftah campus. Now you're finished this class, prayed Maghrib Salah, didn't even get a proper sip of water, and now you're sitting in front of the screen for another program. You quench me, Sheikh. How did I? You quench me. Your company quenches me. Oh, my God. Sheikh Shanawi is fully drained. He did two Juma khutbas at Muslim Unity Center, and then he did three, oh. two, three-hour class. Now he's joining us, so it is, it is. May Allah accept you. I mean, I mean, um, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not used to having the guests next to me, because... When I do make fun of the guests, the guests. intimidating? You're very intimidating. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually like, you know, like you're on the other stage. Sheikh Omar Suleiman is probably on the other side. I can see whatever I want. What is he going to do? Yeah. And like two weeks later, he forgets about it. You're right next to me. So I got to be very careful. And we're talking about the tongue. And so Ustad and Sheikh, when you, just tell us a little bit of background, what you taught us today at the Miftah campus, and we can kick off from there. Sure. Uh, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu Rasulillah. Wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa uh, so the, the discussion was twofold. First, in light of the Sulaiman uh, dialogue with the ant that Allah privileged him to understand, uh, the ant said a random ant, and that was sort of uh, the concept of it wasn't necessarily the queen ant. We didn't understand that from the language of the ayah. It spoke up and it gave people very uh, uh, beneficial in, and clear instructions on how not to be. Uh, trampled over by Sulaiman and his army who were passing through the valley. And so, in a sense, number one, this is, you know, one of millions of ants that exist in these colonies uh, deciding to be important, deciding to be relevant, deciding to be consequential. And so significance is a decision. It didn't just say, I'm some random ant, none of my business. And it also wasn't so self-consumed either to be distracted from the concern for its fellow ants, right? You want to be... Uh, concerned with your fellow human beings, one of two things can happen to get in your way. Either you're too just self-centered, you just care about yourself, your own bottom line. The ant wasn't like that. It didn't just say, oh, snap, army, and it ran. It actually said to the other ants, look out. And the other thing is that you may know that there is danger and want to save them, but feel like, oh my God, who's that going to listen to me? I'm a nobody. And so the fact that it was compassionate and concerned for its fellow ants, and number two, it sort of had that... Uh, resolution that I'm going to save as many people as I can. And so whenever you feel like you can contribute in whatever little corner of the world Allah has placed you, speak up and benefit people. Share some advice, share some praise, word of encouragement, correction. Make sure it's not all corrections, right? Don't be that armchair critic. No one likes that type of person. But in general, offer what you can. Light a candle. Uh, extend a helping hand. Don't ever sell yourself short. That's a big part of it. Small creature. Small yeah. creature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I was saying this in my khutbah today. You know, we have a lot of discussions in our life. Not every discussion is worthy of repetition. Not every discussion is worthy of, you know, research. Oh, yeah, someone had a discussion with you a week ago. Like, did you think about it? No, you slept, you forgot about it. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring a discussion of the ant in the Quran, Allah has the liberty to make bring any surah, any ayah, to take out the time to bring this ayat, ayat of the ant in the, in the Quran and surah named after that, there must be great wisdom. And what is the wisdom of that? What, why would Allah want And then you have hudhud in the next page. Right. Back to back, you have, I'm not saying they're insignificant, they're very significant creatures, but in the grand scope of life, you have greater animals and more apparent exotic creatures. But why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bringing this ant in, surah, in a chapter named Naml, and then you have this hudhud back-to-back with Sulaiman and Dawood, Sulaiman's particular. 
I mean, as far as I've come across in the books of Tefasir and what the scholars have mentioned, the ant, why did he smile? Why was he so impressed with what the ant said? Because the ant sort of exhibited qualities that many human beings, which are the choice creation of Allah, the worthiest candidates to carry his light, they don't have. So most human beings live not knowing the meaning of life to be anything but the herd effect. Munch your way to the slaughterhouse, munch your way to death, right? Wow. The ant was concerned about others. You know, many human beings give in to the whispers of shaitan that you're a nobody and you can never be anybody, right? It spoke up and saw that. Also, the ant was sort of very, very instructive. It didn't just say, we're all going to die, run. It just tell them, go into your dwellings. That was a big part of it. Also, the ant said so that Suleiman and his army don't trample you. It gave the reasoning. And many people sort of, they're a little bit haughty. They just think that because I said it, people have to listen. Just because I think it, people have to agree. But the ant actually tried to help them towards their own betterment, which was survival, by giving them some reasoning, respecting their intelligence. A lot of human beings sort of skip that point. They drop the ball in this, that I have to justify my positions or my opinions or my instructions to people, whoever they may be. And then the last one that we mentioned very quickly was the fact that it said so that Suleiman and his army don't trample you while they don't realize. It well, even gave them the benefit of the doubt well, about something that hasn't even happened yet. So it had like the excuse on hand. It was ready to excuse them even if this disaster would happen. And many human beings, once again, don't have that. Don't have this readiness or this willingness to excuse others when they slip, when they cause damage, when they cause harm inadvertently. That's the end. The hood hood, you know, I, I heard one of, one of the great scholars who's actually currently incarcerated, may Allah Allah for his release. I mean, he, he said that all throughout the Quran, you find that Allah shows the most intelligent creatures their blind spots through lesser creatures. Wow. So that you never think you got it all, right? Wow. Like Surah, Musa alayhi salam is taught by Al-Qadr, and even according to the opinion that Al-Qadr is a prophet, there's no way he compares with Musa alayhi salam. He just knew some things that Musa didn't, and Allah pointed that out for him. When you have uh, the hood hood, Suleiman, you know, alayhi salam, you know, owns and controls all of these kingdoms, something Allah never gave anyone all of human history. And then a hood hood, a, a little Hopi bird comes and says, you know, wow. I, I've come across something. I know something you don't know. And the examples are so many through, through other animals as well uh, that we find in the Quran. And so it is, it is very humbling that no matter how far you reach, over every bearer of knowledge, Allah says someone that is superior in knowledge. SubhanAllah. I, I, I also see that, you know, I will go back to the discussion. Allah loves when people are considerate for others in the grand scope of things, especially whether it's being being destroyed by the army of Sulaiman. Allah just loves khairun nas, anfa'ahum lin nas. Like just thinking beyond yourself, you know. And unfortunately, humans can't do that, you know, like in siblings, you know, like we have that concept in our religion very clearly. Like, I'm not going to you have a little bit of you know, these are loving for others. Loving for others, what you love for yourself. And these are leadership qualities. When an institutions or uh, movements, when they see that people are just beyond their narrow scope of thoughts, they think that's leadership. Like you have, like, what about them? What about them? Because if you can stabilize these people, you've stabilized the institution. The more stability there is, the more stability is in, for a single unit, for an you know, international unit. So I find that in both in these both cases there is compassion for the for the for whatever colony of ants or for the nation of Saba, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala you know informs Sulaiman Salam through this powerful powerful thing that you said Sulaiman Salam in one position was sakhrna lahu riha tajli bi amri rukhan haytha sab wa shayatin kulla banna in wawas he has jinns working for him he had wind at his disposal. And then there comes this bird, there comes this ant. Never should we feel as imams, as leaders, or even teachers, that some kid's position in the back is useless for me. Sometimes kids speak up and, and they say things to the parents. What do you know? In that, in that word of innocence, there's something you've never heard. You know, I'll give you an example. It's not the best example, but um, I'm not trying to validate something or invalidate something. I just want you guys... So, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, okay, you'll be the judge. <laughs> so I was taking um, uh, my daughter, 24 years old. I just gave you too much information publicly. It is what it is. She's 24 years old uh, a while back. And uh, 
you know, we don't celebrate birthdays, but you know how we Muslim community are? We don't celebrate birthdays, but we'll buy gifts. Then we don't celebrate birthdays. We're this buying, cake was on sale. Yeah, this cake was on sale. <laughs> and then when everybody comes, we don't celebrate birthdays, but there's candles on the cake. Yeah. We don't celebrate, the people just showed up for food. We don't celebrate birthdays, we're just saying happy birthday. And we're a confused nation. Overall, that's almost happening with me too, because my children are living with friends and I'm the imam, I gotta be careful. So I, I do that. I definitely want to buy a gift for my daughter. It's like 10, two weeks, three weeks before her birthday, but I don't want to do the day of. So I'm kind of, you kind of do with the, you have to kind of mother, like changing, changing the law here on my favor. I'm not justifying it. But I do have this to the age of like seven, I'll buy gifts for my kids, not on the day of, day off, a few days later, a few days before, but no major celebration. People in the crowd might think my kids are missing out on the fun in life, but they have potential other ways of having fun too. So I'm taking her to Target, and my my two sons are with me, and my slang girl goes, Dad, so why don't we celebrate birthdays? You know, anyone that does, I'm not here to criticize you. And I'm like, you know, the Prophet lived 63 years. He had daughters. He had six children, seven children, four daughters. And uh, he didn't celebrate any of their birthdays, and he had hundreds and thousands of friends and companions never showed up to a birthday party. So I don't think it was, I don't, I don't believe it was part of the tradition, and not, is it, not that it's necessary, and we want to do what's closer to his tradition and his teaching. So Allah said them. So my son looks at me, and I'm not saying it's haram, I'm, not, I'm just saying it's, the Prophet didn't do it, so it's not sunnah, right? So the Prophet, um, and the, the young guy, young boy looks at me, my son, he says, Dad, well, there's so many sunnahs that we don't do. Why is this one of the sunnahs that you all of a sudden, <laughs> like, you're stuck on? Like, there's so many other sunnahs, like, we've completely neglected, and this is one of those sunnahs that you just caught on and it makes it becoming a big issue. The reality is that the kid said something. Either he's saying that we all need to figure out all of our sunnahs, right? Or he's saying that Islam is flexible. And I'm not going to say it's flexible, but the reality is now you're going to have a discussion with this kid. You can't stop him. He's a kid. You need to in, in, impress on him what is the right way and the closest way to the Prophet ﷺ without him belittling his friends who are doing it. And this, this is challenges of the culture and society. For prophets to listen to an aunt, it was not belittling. It was, it was something of knowledge. It was something of importance. And just the fact that he stopped. He had to stop the entire army to listen to this, hear, hear this aunt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allamna mantaq al You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the, 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 the art of understanding creatures. So they, they give them advantage. But how many times people say things and we passively just ignore them? Like, yeah, who cares? Let them, let them, let them make noise. They didn't even make noise. But sometimes in their noise, they're not always, not always, don't get me wrong. But sometimes in their voice, there might be a valid, valid point. And not always. I'm just saying like sometimes like someone's saying something, we can re retrospect ourselves. They're not all 100% right. They can be biased or can be jealous. They can be haters. But I, I, what if? Yeah. What if? You know? So here comes Suleiman and Salaam. He's like, I'm not trying. You think I'm going to crush you? Like, no. Then the, the aunt goes, Didn't you hear what I said? I'm a Samaritan Qawli. Like, Suleiman and Salaam talks about the app in Tafsir. He says, I, I, like, I'm a Tadri. Don't you know? Anni Malakun Adil. You know, like, don't you know, I'm Malikun Adil. I am a just king. I'm not going to walk right over you if I know you're there. So the aunt says back to Suleiman, like, I'm not accusing you, but I'm saying you would do it neglectfully. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying it. So it's beautiful that um, the aunt speaks up. Voice is heard. And the more, I mean, we talk about giving voices to our youth and children and sisters in our society. In the moment they speak, we shut them up. The moment they say something, we silence them. And that's the, t that's the other side of the discussion. Like how should we speak? And how should our language be when we speak to people of adults? Was the at disrespectful? I don't think so. I think it was bold. This is, you could tell us more about this. What is the difference between being upfront, bold, unafraid, unapologetic, but not being disrespectful? This is the king. This is not just a king. This is a prophet of Allah. So how do you balance that, Sheikh? Yeah, that's uh, a very important, I guess, sort of set of principles that we need to. Establish. It happens with parents, right? Like, like with parents, parents with scholars, right? yeah, across the board. We, we have to sort of never stop being uh, active thinkers, critical thinkers, uh, independent thinkers, uh, while still being loving of our of our elders, of our superiors, of our scholars, of otherwise. 
we want to be loving and critical. You know, like when Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, the great scholar, was sort of documenting his reservations on a certain sort of breakdown in, in the Tzkiyah discussion, discussion how to purify your heart, when he was discussing the book of Al-Harawi, rahimahullah, he says, Al-Harawi is a sheikh of Islam, and uh, he is our sheikh, and uh, we love him, but the truth is more beloved to us. Wow. Right? The, that whole idea of us, ven like, it's actually not a disrespect to our elders or to our uh, our scholars to sometimes disagree with them because we're actually, you know, protecting them and sometimes even living up to their legacy of living for truth. They disagreed with their teachers sometimes as well because they felt committed. They had a sort of a commitment to the tradition that caused them to study under these teachers and caused them to sometimes depart from the conclusions of their teachers. It's all in love and in respect for what they lived for. 100%. So when someone steps away from the position of their scholar, that's out of love for the, what the scholar was actually teaching, which is respect of Allah and his messenger first and foremost, which is seeing us as conduits, as channels, as mediums to discovering Allah's sacred deen, not as getting in the way of that sacred deen. With parents, same thing. Like parents sometimes may share with us instructions that are not correct. And it is actually out of love for our parents that we respectfully decline to obey their authority in that. Because wow. they don't have authority in that because nobody has ultimate authority, right? Only Allah has ultimate authority. So even our parents, if they're asking us to do something that's not within their authority, we can respectfully decline. Uh, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, when, when he was speaking about uh, the impermissibility of forced marriages in Islam, wow. right? He said, and if the four madhabs agree that you cannot force feed your child something they cannot bear to eat. I know the kids are going to love this and just like take a, a snippet of this. Yeah, yeah. And now we said we don't have to eat broccoli. It's perfect. And now we said Ibn Taymiyyah said. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get stronger and stronger. I can see it snowballing. But he's saying if food only sits in your body for a few short hours and you still can't force it on your child wow. if they can't bear it. They're gagging. Like not, Allah gave us different palates, right? Yeah. Figure out a different vegetable, basically. It doesn't have to be that one. He said, then how can a parent ever have the authority to force someone to live a lifetime with someone they can't bear to live with? Wow. Right? And so that doesn't mean you, you're, you're allowed to go to war with your parents. It's actually extremely hard to sort of stand your ground and like invoke or vindicate your own right that Allah gave you to, to choose your spouse or like accept the choice of spouse, either or. And at the same time, not flip out when someone's trying to take that right from you. It's like Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, right? When it, his mom was trying to take away his right to be Muslim. Yeah. For sure, like he, he basically was patient, was patient, was patient, was patient. Then he snapped. He said, listen, eat or don't eat. She went on hunger strike. He, he said, eat or don't eat. If you had a hundred lives and you died in front of me a hundred times, I'm not going to leave their legit of Muhammad. Shush. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then Allah sends down the ayah. We entrusted you to be good to your parents. They took care of you and they raised you to the end of it. And if they force you to leave Islam, don't obey them. Yeah, you're right in that, in standing your ground. But then it said, yeah. But you had no right to be disrespectful. Give them good companionship in this world. So to juggle both, for sure, it's tricky and it's tough. But, you know, I remember Sheikh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, one time a, a girl called in, young girl, and she said, my parents are not letting me wear hijab. And I know in Islam, obeying your parents is really big. And so do I have to obey my parents in this? Like it sounds like a conundrum. He said, no, it is out of the kindness. Birrul walidain here means defy your parents. Because well, being kind to your parents involves, includes lessening the load they will carry on the day of judgment. Wow. And so you not committing that sin is lessening their load on the day of judgment. Just perspective. It's perspective. It's perspective. Right? So be respectful, stand your ground. No one should ever out etiquette you in your disagreements. But at the same time, you're allowed to have an opinion and you should. Right. And that's in terms of like mistakes or disagreements or bad advice. But also, if I could just add one more, if you have something to fill the void with, to contribute with, you know, that famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim where uh, the Prophet وسلم, asks them what tree is most similar to the believer. And they started mentioning all these different trees uh, that were from the desert, desert trees, like shrubs and stuff from the desert. And Abdullah ibn Umar, so the young son of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anh, he said, I knew it was the palm tree, but I couldn't speak because Abu Bakr and Umar are there and people of their age were there. The elders are there. Yeah. I can't speak with the elders there. And so eventually the Prophet ﷺ said, no, none of these. The, 
the believers like the palm tree. <laughs> you know, palm tree stable, palm tree bends, it comes right back, it doesn't snap. The believer, you know, with life's punches, he keeps rolling with them because he believes in Allah's qadr. He gives fruits all year round sometimes. All of that, as the believer, yeah. right? So anyway, they walk out and he says, Dad, I knew it was the palm tree, yep. but I couldn't say it because you and Abu Bakr and the <laughs> seniors are there. He said, had you said it, it would have meant the world to me. If you got something to say, say it. Wow. If you can add value, add. Surah yeah. dunya Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful story because sometimes, you know, we, we have that concept like being humble. Be humble. Don't, if you know something, don't say it sometimes. If you know sometimes you're asked a question, like, I knew the answer. Like, no. And that also, you know, brought, when, I heard, when I first came across that narration, it also speaks of like, doesn't matter how pious you are. You love for your children to succeed in Islamic knowledge. And it's it is for the fitra. Like you, your, your child memorizes the Quran, like you're excited. Like, that's my child. You know, like people do that for spelling bee, which is still fine. You, you love your children, but like loving your children and their success is not it's something that you, you cannot control. Yeah, we all have that, but I think also we need to communicate that more. Yeah. Right? Because everyone uh, reads things differently. Wow. You know, my dad, uh, Rahimahullah, may Allah give him mercy. Okay. One of the things I do remember, he was not sort of very uh, uh, emotionally uh, expressive. It's immigrant parents, most, most like well, not all immigrant parents, but yeah. they 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 were our parents. Parents, I don't know. My parents' parents were from the army. They were just there was just an army martial law, and like they yeah. understood when they were happy. The language communication was limited. Yeah, I think a lot of that was the case, uh, and other factors as well in my father's upbringing. Uh, he never really saw his dad. His dad died really early, so he's been working since yeah, he was like 13. Yeah. And that, a lot tough, of the tough. dynamic. So, but one of the things, though, maybe because Allah knows best, maybe I'm ungrateful, maybe they were really, in fact, few. But one of the few things I do recall he used to say, and it sticks with me, he used to say to me, you're the only person in the world that I, fitra-wise, would accept to be better than me. You need to know that. He said that. Yeah. Every person in the world wants to be the best. <laughs> and you envy people that beat you. I need you to explain, that, you to explain that to them. Tell you one more time what your dad said. It's so beautiful. I forgot. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> that was beautiful. My father said, you're the only person in the world who I would accept. Rather, I would be happy that you were better than me in something. Right? Everyone else in the world, that would tick me off that they outdid me. Unconditional except love. Except my child. Unconditional love. Right? But we need to express that. Tell them, we want you to be better. We want you to be bigger. We want you to be smarter. We want you to be more righteous. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give your father the highest level in physical Ameen. 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 Sheikh, you know, remember that one time Umar bin Khattab was trying to put a, uh, a limitation on mahr, right? Qantar. I don't know if you mentioned it in class today. I did. Yeah. And, and you talk about Umar bin Khattab legislating the dowry in Juma Khutbah. Like the Juma Khutbah is where cases and concerns of the Muslim Ummah will be addressed. The whole nation is there. You know, it's your congressional address, weekly address, basically mm -hmm. for the Muslim Ummah. And the Khalifa is speaking about some personal, very intimate case, which is marriage. And the dowry, he's trying to legislate a limitation. What happens on the woman's side? Sister just stands up. He says, you cannot limit something that Quran has left. Right. Mutlaq. Put a maximum gift amount. You can't put a maximum gift amount yeah. on, on women when they get married. So Umar bin Khattab again the sister speaks up. Umar doesn't feel threatened that what is what is Ali gonna think about this? You know, like I mean there's a sahaba here, my student Ibn, Ibn Abbas is here. The sister in the back row from the women's side gets up in the middle of the khutbah, fi al khutbah, corrects Umar and Umar bin Khattab says. Asabat uh, al-Mara wa Akhtar Umar. You know? Woman's right, Umar's wrong. Umar, the, the woman has spoken the truth and she's absolutely right. And I, Umar, made a mistake here. So it's it's really humbling to see such beautiful individuals like Umar al-Khattab, who, subhanAllah, Quran. That's spiritual refinement, though, right? The Quran has spiritually refined these people because at the end of the day, only someone that has nothing to prove to the people not seeking their approval that we you get it anyway right when allah is approving of 100 percent. but you're seeking the approval of allah and seeking the approval of allah means bobbing and weaving with the truth wherever you find it right yeah and like all of subhanallah the sahaba they conceded to so much and they stepped down so much and they accepted the advice so much wherever it came from because that's what the prophet raised them on 
you know, you think of the hadith also of shaitan, the jinn that Abu Huraira caught, right? Yeah. That's, that's really useful here too, right? Abu Huraira was placed to sort of watch guard, a night watch over the, the warehouse where sort of zakah was being collected before the distribution, like dates and things like this, staple foods. And every night this man would get caught stealing and finally the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, Oh, Abu Huraira, you know who, who you've been playing cat and mouse with basically the last three nights. Uh, he said, who? He said, that was a shaitan. That was a jinn that had taken human form. And he said, Sadaqaka wa huwa yeah. He was truthful to you in the last advice that read Ayat kursi and it'll help you at night. He told him, I'll teach you something, let me go. So he taught him Ayat kursi and Abu Huraira let him go. And the next morning, the Prophet was like, you know who that was? That was a shaitan. He was truthful to you, meaning about Ayat kursi even though he is kadhu. And the word kadhu in the Arabic language means a perpetual liar. Mubalagha. So yeah, super recurrence in, yeah. in particular, not just a big liar, meaning a constant liar. Wow. And so someone who's constantly lying and says something true, you want to accept it. Wow. So what about anybody else? If the believer was taught, the Sahaba were trained, that if it's verified to be a word of truth, even from shaitan himself, wow. <laughs> we take it. SubhanAllah. Um, what, where is the concept of like man too? You know, like sometimes, you know, you have, um, you know, if you man can even believe will you akhir khayran awli asmut. You know, the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever believes in the day of judgment, believes in Allah in the day of judgment, either you say something good or you shutting your mouth. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, like not always you have an opinion that's necessarily correct. You know, yeah. like a lot of times. I mean, except not accepting the advice, like we've been talking about, accept it from anywhere. I think a big part of that is just, we just blurt things out. We're all in like ego defense mode and just like, no. And uh, so that's the thing, right? Whoever keeps to silence will survive, right? Because as Umar said, the more you speak, the more you slip. The more you slip, the more sinful you are. Because not every slip is accidental. Some of them are avoidable. That's the idea. So wow. some of them you're not forgiven for. Wow. They're more sinful. And they said, the more sinful you are, the more likely you are to go to the fire. Oh so it all starts with silence. And people think that silence is about not lying, right? Like, do you think the only problem with the tongue? No, there's a lot. There's like not lying. Uh, there's also not saying the truth in a disrespectful way. <laughs> it's also about, you know, not saying the truth towards evil ends because you can use a, a true word for bad ends, right? Wow. Like gaslight and, and manipulate and otherwise. You could say the truth for the wrong reasons, right? Like showing off with the truth. I prayed, you know, 300 rakahs last night. Yeah. Not me. That was the night before. We, we both do. <laughs> so, you know, someone was praying the other day. He's praying like an extra, uh, I think it was, I said, I said, my body is sitting and my soul is praying. And the guy was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it works. He believed it too. Go ahead. Sorry. So the idea of holding our tongues is, is not just from not lying. There's so many ills of the tongue. So you really have to restrain them. And the Salaf were really good at that. But in terms of accepting advice, just to tie, I guess, the beginning of the discussion with, with your most recent question, when you speak up, like, in disagreement too fast, mm. it makes it even harder for you to walk that back. Oh, my God. Because, like, you have an opinion, and I disagreed with it. Now there's more on the line because I've expressed it. I, I, people I, heard me express it. I would love to get an argument with you. I want to see how good you're applying this. this nah, is, it's, it's tough, right? right? We just got to shut our mouth, right? Wow. But, but when do we shut our mouth? Number one, when you don't know enough about the situation or you don't know enough about Islam to apply the Islamic principles to the situation, right? Wow. wow. Like, I'll give you an example. We comment on news a lot. I know I, I'm going to come politics. up with as a little bit of an extremist here. No, like, let's let's talk about something simpler than politics crime happened somewhere across the globe you sit there and you share about this guy raped that woman well how do you do you even know the name of the person who shared that news article with you let alone the one who wrote the news article let alone the actual incident on the ground you don't know the situation nor do you know the islamic sort of protocol to assess the situation had you even known it firsthand could it could it be because of fox news <laughs> like could it be no, like we can't blame everything on fox news no like could it be like it people, could be of diarrhea of the mouth. You know, it could be like people are apps. People are just sharing information without like yeah. big media channels. That, that's so why now everyone's like it's, 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 everyone's talking just rubbish, and everyone just it's become a trend. And that's exactly what the hadith says. The Prophet والسلام, said, uh, yeah. "It's enough lying, meaning enough to destroy you." 
enough lying for a person to simply relay everything they hear. The share button, right? Mm -hmm. The the forward on the WhatsApp or, or Telegrams, if there's a share button on Telegram, I don't know. The idea is just certain circulation, unnecessary, unfiltered circulation is a humongous problem, right? You know, you know what's happening? You know people keep on sharing people's stuff? They're free. They got nothing to do. Uh, uh, he, 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 and this is another subject now, right? Of speaking on Islamic issues without qualification, you without training. You just ignore my statement. No, I'm about to agree with I you. I feel like you think I'm stupid or something. Just... <laughs> he came across the people and he found them just talking, talking, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he said these people had nothing better to do Man. and were too lazy to do ibadah, devotion. And so they act like they're speaking as a form of ibadah. Sometimes you sort of tokenize the deen as if you're religious because you talk more deen. When it could just be self-promotion. You flexing on each other. Yeah, like literally. Over chai. You know that, that, that kafa bil mawti wa ibadah, kafa bil ita'ati shawla, wa kafa bil yaqeen ghina, wa kama khaisa sa. You know, like just like keeping yourself, people always like, you know, if we are, ourselves are engaged in purposeful activities, you know, like, you are 100%, mashallah, people who are involved. And you either you got time to write an article, you got to prepare a speech, you got to do some counseling, you got to go meet some sick brother in the community. Some, so many things happening in, in your life. And then you, you open your chat, this, this chat room is just, I don't, I don't want to say the word bombarded because it sounds a little extreme because we're in the people are going to think we're extremists. But this whole chat room is just flooded with unnecessary messages, whether you want to read the whole thing or just go to the bottom of it, right? And yeah, the more you you hear and the more you see, the more you'll speak also. Exactly. Right? So busy yourself with good so that falsehood doesn't sort of consume you. And also your eyes, right, are, are an inlet to your heart. And whatever's in your heart, you're going to translate it out again, right? So personally, personally, what type of person are you? Like if you, if you do news feeds up to you about some situation, about someone, are you doubt it? Do you doubt it right away? Or are you... Are you uh, I drive people crazy with that. Stuff. Really? Every time someone says to me something, I'll be like, there's at least three sides to every story. It's like, no, I'm just, oh, yeah, fuck, I'm so, really sorry. So you are a skeptic right away? Absolutely. Wow. You have to be. Tell us why. We're talking about the honor of people. Like, even if Allah forgives me, will this person ever forgive me? I'll never know till the day of judgment. And really, it just life experience also, you know this. Yeah. You'll hear from one party in disputes, and it's not just in disputes, but you hear from one party in disputes. You can't help but like your sense of justice like sympathizes immediately like how could he or how could she and then you hear finally from the other side and you're like well, what's that statement someone was, comes with the eye in their socket yeah. you know the other guy might lose two eyes al hasan al-basri said if i if i see a guy with one eye poked out i will never judge in his favor because it's possible that he poked both the other eyes Shush. out of the next of the other guy so you don't know. You right? know, then you come like really back to the second point. Like we're in a situation where people are speaking without thinking. People are sharing without verifying. You kind of come to a place where like, I just need to stay quiet. Like, well, yes, I've it. You know, like, alayka bin nafsik. Hamsik alayka lisanak. Hamsik alayka lisanak. In the hadith, mm. somebody asked the Prophet Sallallahu what is success? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, this is back then. This is before we had social media. He's like, he's like, I'm sick. I like lisanic. I'm sick. I like lisanic. For us, would be all tools of communication. Yeah. Just hold your Just tongue. Your tongue. That Abu Dhar, Abu, you talked about Abu, Abu Dhar today. He says, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or he narrates, or another Sahabi said, Ja Rajul Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Arabi Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qariya Rasulullah, all senior ages. Give me some advice, but keep it concise. And in, in the Prophet Sallallahu companions, I love the. The informality sometimes and the formality they're just straightforward you know like you know if a student comes up to me says, Abdullah, i gotta find this keep it brief keep it brief i'm like what are you talking about <laughs> like brief no no you don't slap you no i don't no 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 i, I don't i don't physically abuse people i i i I'm <laughs> <laughs> no no you know, i'm the eldest of the brothers so there's a little bit emotional happening there but power dynamics but like I, it's, it's like you this guy comes to the prophet وسلم, and he says Give me some advice, keep it simple. And the Prophet now has to think about simplicity, but also can't like, like it has to be voluminous. It has to be what this guy needs because profound. profound. He says, 
uh, إذا كنت تصلي الصلاة فصلي صلاة مودع. Whenever you pray, make pretend this is your final prayer. Not just about prayer, but relationships. Your final time, you come to Medina. How would you leave Medina if this was your final time? Um, saying salam to your mother if you're walking out of the house. And especially if it's from a different state and she's aged, your mother, your father, even your wife, your husband. You know, like a lot of times we leave our parents, our spouses in a very mean manner. And so the whole angle changes because it doesn't matter what happened, what argument happened, it's just not worth it if this is how we ended it, you know, and we're going to regret it if this was the last time we met. So uh, uh, so speaking, um, meaning, doing everything as with ihsan. Like if this was your last time doing this, your meetings will be done with ihsan, your, your reading of Quran, your salah, it's just a concept of excellence in everything. So he, he infuses that on this man. The guy understands. He's a Bedouin. The second thing he says, don't say something that you will regret tomorrow. You know? And that's why Shafi says, Imam Shafi was a great scholar, wrote hundreds of fatwas, thousands of fatwas. Now you know Yaqeen, right? Yaqeen is like Imam Shafi to a certain extent, where they're writing contemporary, necessary, you know, you know like really like controversial sometimes discussions and you're going to find people they're going to say like imam shafi like what do you think you are you think you're the new imam in town <laughs> you like you think you're the new institution in town you're the new yaqeen in town right or you think the new shafi in town like he is imam shafi they're speaking to the institute the man you're like mm-hmm. yaqeen is a uh, 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 members 40 50 research Sheikh imam shafi was the institute so he's a movement, for sure. He's a movement. And you can, and we think like, you know, I'm sure when Yaqeen, Miftah, or other institutions get attacked, people like, I mean, we feel like, why are you attacking us? Man, we're researchers. Imam Shafi was attacked, right? But he was very calculated in his response. There were attacks on Imam Shafi where they called him Shia. You know, they called him uh, different wild names, uh, someone that reforming the religion. Abu Hanifa had it this way, Malik had it, your teacher had it this way, who are you to do this? <laughs> like, imagine I go against my teachers. You Sheikh Hatim is your teacher, right? Imagine you go against Sheikh Hatim for some of the discussion. People like, me and all my brothers like, your Sheikh is otherwise. You're otherwise, what are you talking about? You're facing the opposite Dibla, <laughs> you know? So Imam Shafi, would, he would, every time people said, he could, you know, he used to say in a poem, he says, لَوْلَ الشِّعْرُ بِالْعُلَمَاءِ يُزْرِي لَكُنْتُ الْيَوْمَ أَشْعَرَ مِنْ لَبِيدِي Poet, eloquence wise, he says, if I became a poet, and if it wasn't if poetry wasn't belittled, I would be considered the greatest poets of the Arabs. In the time of the Prophet, Labid was a very eloquent poet who spoke about the most relevant discussions, and he became a top hit um, poems. And you know, if there was BET, he would be the top. You know, so uh, chart number one for like decades. Um, and he's like, there were these great fighters, everyone talked about them. When everyone said, you know, fighting, you are the Khabib, like, you know, you are the, the eagle in the battlefield. So he says, but I don't think it's necessary for me to flex like that, right? Like, he had that eloquence, he had the ability, he had the, the strength, he had the followers. When people criticized him, he didn't reply always. Many times he just stayed silent. He could have just taken that pen and his pen worked like magic. SubhanAllah. His qalam, his writing was just excellent. And his intellect was profound. He says, Sometimes you're speaking up to someone who's un, in, who doesn't understand your level of uh, what your purpose is. And they're jealous and they're just haters. you answering them. You're giving them, oh, what's that right word? You're just giving them attention. In the Jawab Ali Babi Sharim, oh, Shafi answered. Yaqeen answered. Like, why would this screw them? You know, like, screw my language, like, go them a fly kite, you know? In the Jawab Ali Babi Sharim, if that was some to an Ahmadin, shut up Like, sometimes just to stay quiet in front of an idiot is your honor. You know, like, well, if you like a teacher gets to be disrespected by a student, you think teachers had to fight him? Like, come on, you're just a kid. And in that, is your own rectification, your own islah. Like everything that is being done against a person, or said against a person, against the institution, like Miftah or Yaqeen or Imam Shafi, for example, is islah for the institution. Like, yeah, I think that's very valuable as well. I mean, know? for sure, we want to elevate the discourse and we don't ever want to act like we're, we're creating uh, sort of super scholars or super medhebs or super anything. 
I hear these discussions, I don't mean we as in Yaqeen, we as in sort of those that are practitioners or students or advocates of the Islamic sciences in general. Like I hear it in fiqh assemblies that, you know, uh, why don't we try to revamp this for this? But the, the great imams are wiser than that. They never try to impose sort of their madhab or their like perspective Malik. or their interpretation. I'm thinking of Malik and, and others as well. I mean, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, even when, when he refused, he refused to be the chief court justice and went through all he went through late in life because of that. This was this could have been a big part of it as well, right? Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, when he uh, when he asked that his ijtihadat be burned. Wow. Uh, because, Can you explain ijtihadat? Yeah, so basically his independent research, his own discretionary judgments, his understandings of the Quran and Sunnah, uh, he didn't want them sort of codified. He didn't want them in books, at least during his life. Just in case people take Because them. he's seen it being taken too far, being wow. taken to crowd Quran and Sunnah, not by the Imams, but by sort of the, the subsequent masses. generations and otherwise and of the masses. He's seen attack with Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi'i, and so he wanted to sort of tighten the valves a little bit, lessen the likelihood it would happen with sort of his fatawa that were sought far and wide. So we all want to do that, and it's always an opportunity as well to, to keep. So we want to elevate the discourse. We want to know our place here. And we also don't want to sort of silence uh, uh, thoughtful criticism, because as you said, this adds to sort of the, the robustness of Islamic scholarship and Islamic discourse. Scholars have been disagreeing forever, mm -hmm. right? But there's, there's a difference for sure between sort of, uh, you know, uh, throwing throwing sort of like mud grenades at each other and between sort of thoughtfully, objectively right. critiquing have question, have one question. another. Let me just give you one example that comes to mind. You're going to be excited. You're going to be excited. I know you have to leave. Uh, al fudail rahimahullah, I believe it was al fudail they said to him, so-and-so said that you're a show-off. Mm. And That's what people say to me too. I want to hear the answer. <laughs> So if you want to really embarrass them, here's the answer. All right. <laughs> uh, so Al-Fudayl, rahimahullah, said, Oh Allah, if it's true what he's saying, forgive me. Oh man. And if it's false what he's saying, forgive him. Wow. So like even that, if you're sort of uh, fixated on the akhirah, could be an opportunity, right? Uh, that it is possible that I'm showing off. <sighs> I mean, he can't know my wow. name, but then again, I can't know it either. Wow. Right? So... If it's true, might be true, then forgive me. And if it's not true, forgive him. Wow. Right? Even Umm Darda, radiallahu anha, they said to her that the... Uh, I just want people to understand what you just said. That is such a powerful... Use it, channel it, right? Channel it in your own reform. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's not always like, oh, yeah, what do you... Like, subhanAllah. Yeah. Umm Darda, radiallahu anha, not in the... So this was introspection. Another way you can channel it is to sort of make humble yourself a little bit it's okay for you to get criticized right in terms of uh, you, so she said when they told her that some of the umayyad sort of emirs umayyad governors or even the khalifa himself were were bashing her and like uh, speaking ill of her she said we have been praised so many times when we didn't deserve it wow so what's the big deal when we sort of get dispraised a little bit and we don't deserve it wow like a little bit of here and there subhanallah I think these are very healthy ways to channel uh, difficult treatment. Capitalism is totally opposite of this. You know, like how American society works. If you get a bad review, one on Google, like it just makes you sleepless for your marketing, your money, because your end bottom line is customers. Yeah, yeah, greed. Greed. And Islam is totally different. Like one, two people, few people, big mouth, jealous individuals, have an agenda, just want to slander you. They're going to say things about me. I you. meant greed also that you want to have everyone sort of accept you. Wow. That's just wrong. Because, wow. you know, the prophet. Uh, Al Hassan, uh, not even the prophet. Salah Salah Salah. Salah. He didn't get sort of like a unanimous acceptance. Exactly. Right? Yeah, opposite. When, Jesus. when, when Al Hassan, uh, Rahim, uh, yeah, Rahimahullah, they said to him, certain people sit in your gatherings to listen in on your discussions just to hold things against you. Wow. They're fishing for content. Against you, so many people Juma Khutbah have that same problem. Uh, it's your Juma Khutbah, not mine. People love me. Oh. I'm talking about an Alan. Oh. <laughs> Got him. Good one. I'm just joking. Smooth. No, 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 I don't know if there's anyone from Alan Town. They're never gonna invite me. He loves Alan Town, and all you guys love him too. Just... So Al Hassan said to him, "Take it easy on yourself. Don't get all worked up about this guy fishing against you." Yeah, yeah. He said, "I have uh, sort of chased." And like desired Jannah and found it to be chaseable. Like you can attain Jannah by Allah's mercy, but you can. 
and I chased or like pursued escaping the fire and I found it doable. You can escape the fire. People will escape the fire. And I pursued pleasing everyone and I found that that one was not possible. Oh my God. Right? In, in another narration, they, he said, how can you expect this from people when Allah didn't even grant it to himself? Yeah. Humanity is not uni- unanimously approving of God. How could they be approving of the creatures of God? SubhanAllah. So we just need to lower the expectations and pray for our brothers and sisters yeah. and try to exemplify how we can elevate the discourse in general whenever sort of that uh, like inappropriate language does surface sometimes, sometimes with good intentions, but still yeah. the, the packaging and the optics are important as well. The, the, I'm going to just, I don't want to take it to like a personal, like, you know, too, too intimate and, and we're going we're gonna to have to run out of time, but sometimes it becomes like a obligation on my part. Like if somebody attacks you, and it's not true. You can be silent. I understand. Like that's what the the, the the situation is expecting from you. Like you know, be patient, be tolerant, be forgiving. But like, not necessarily for me because I have students that learn from you, and they're following this negative feed and they believe it. They're just students. They're kids. Of course, I can I can talk to one. I can talk to two. I can talk to three. But I got students all across America. You know, like, and this is happening on on a platform that's been globalized into like international. Uh, 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 coverage. So what happens is a lot of times I'm ready to stay quiet for myself, but I'm not ready to stay quiet against someone else. Just being, you know, like, you know, and I feel like it becomes an obligation for us sometimes to speak up on behalf of someone that is being oppressed, you know, that is being slandered, you know, and, and maybe you don't have to do it yourself, the person who's being slandered. But will that help? You see, this is all subject. Maybe just clearance of to people. pros and cons calculus. In other words, there are different ways you can defend the person, right? Okay. You could sort of continue to associate with them. You can try to clarify in brief certain positions. But sometimes, if this is not done carefully, this can add fuel to the fire, right? You give me more Why did Uthman, radiallahu an, of course, I'm not calling anyone khawarij here. But why did Uthman, radiallahu an, refuse to allow the sons of Ali, radiallahu an, to defend him, right? Wow. Because grander scheme of things that was going to spill out into a civil war in Medina. And they'll blame him, right? Blame him. And he already knew his duty. He already knew that this would happen. The Prophet ﷺ already told him uh, he would be killed. He already told him, don't step down from the position, don't abdicate it. So the instructions were there. What benefit is left? I saw an young zero with Khamis, the hope that they're going to get zero. Flatan zero. Yeah. So uh, there are other ways to do this because, you know, I but don't what, want but, to be what? too too sort of like uh, fixated on the subject, but it is counterproductive to refute the refutation culture. Wow. Right? You actually just signed up for it. Shush. Right? And so we don't want to do that. And I, and, and being, being out of my experience, that's been the best. I'm not saying sign treatment, but just like rise above the tide in these situations. You know, it's not stay productive. Stay productive. You make mistakes. We ask Allah to forgive us. You know, like we miss, I make mistakes, you know, no one's excellent. I can, we speak, um, we speak um, uh, so many hours a, a day in, 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 in weeks, years of our khutbahs are online, things that we've done. We make mistakes. And, you know, the, the minute people start to idolize us as thinking that we're perfect humans, you're like, you know, like it's disappointing. Of course it's disappointing. Your parents are not perfect. No one's perfect. And they see things like, oh, my dad has said a racist statement. Wow. I'm not saying my dad. My dad's not racist. My dad loves all types of people. But someone says that. I'm like, are you, why are you shocked? It's like, because of my thought, my, my, I have this, you know, this this uh, perception of my dad. He's the perfect example. That's like, your problem. That's your problem. He's a human. He makes mistakes. You know, inshallah, we rectify that. I'm not saying it's acceptable. We'll rectify right. it. So overall, you know, in you is some jahiliya. Yeah, oh, said to the Sahabi, <laughs> yeah, in you, if the yeah. Sahabi are like that, then everyone yeah. else, you know, is even more so. so. Like, so we have some challenges in our life, and uh, we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give the the people who watch scholars to have them sometimes help them overlook mistakes of people, and even you know, it's not just about scholars. Generally, like you said, speak up when it's helpful. And not to share what's not verified, you know, and exactly what you said. And I, I think the tongue is very dangerous. Somebody said this very nice. I don't know if it was Sheikh Salam Allah or someone. So you see, he said, I think the verbal 
accusation or verbal slander or verbal you know, communications, the harm is still limited compared to the virtual. Because you said it, I said it verbally, it ended up here. It's contained. It's contained. But once I share the something. Internet doesn't forget. As they internet say. doesn't forget. You, you, how do you even retract that now? You made an accusation about someone, brother, sister, someone, and you're like, oh, oh, where, where do you retreat? How do you retract this? So that, right. like, don't ever say something that tomorrow you're going to regret it. And sometimes, so many times, we're sitting at a wedding table and our ego kicks in and we feel like we have to say something and you just feel guilty. You know that one statement, You know, like, I never regretted staying silent once in my life. Like, like of course, if there's oppression, you speak up. But I have regretted multiple times speaking up unnecessarily, you know? And Jarahat, proportionally speaking, proportionally per- speaking, you'll regret way more the times you spoke up. Yeah. You know, than the times you've kept silent. I don't know if it's me that's getting older. Silence can be sinful. We're not denying that. Hundred percent. So no one online misunderstands. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, nothing keeps me silent. Not even Wonder Bread. I speak up. <laughs> you know, go ahead. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, the, 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 the sheikh is like because Ibn Abbas used to cry. Radiallahu anhu ma kamra ina wasn't catch now. When he reads the the story of the people who were silent about those who were fishing on Saturday, he, he every time he hears about those who were silent. From not denouncing that, he used to cry. And wow. say, how many times have we been silent in life? And we, uh, how many times we've seen wrong and we were silent? <sighs> but again, you want to take the sentiment behind that, that sense of fear of Allah and fear of reckoning, but it still has to be applied through the pros, cons, calculus. Still, is there greater benefit in speaking or not? Do mashura of people that are sort of impartial, experienced, scholarly, objective ask them and be careful and because you know Ibn Taymiyyah as he often says that it is actually impermissible to speak up if the greater likelihood is it will be cause more harm right wow. and so you want to sort of be very afraid of speaking up and very afraid of being silent but not paralyzed in neither you got to sort of figure out a framework for this where you can objectively sift out verify when I should do this and when that but the default is silence. You're right. Wow. The Prophet Sallam said, speak good or keep silent. Now we said that means stay silent until you're sure that they're not even equal. There's clearer, Benefit. more good than evil. And, and we shouldn't overestimate our ability to assess that. Mashura, right? Ask people, consult. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have enough words to thank Sheikh uh, so Muhammad Shinnawi. You know, he's been with us since he came to Michigan on Thursday, right? I was here on Monday for ICD. Yeah. Monday. Monday to Thursday. Been here, yeah. So he was teaching a oh, course Monday, Thursday in Detroit. And then he spent the weekend with us at Miftah and at Unity Center. And we're very grateful. These are the discussions that we have just on like dinner table. What we just talked about right now, sometimes we get a little too excited. He gave me a you know high five. He almost slapped my face. But you know, it's these are the things that we talk about, you know. A little bit. I, I I do I with the with the exception I do a little bit riba of Sheikh Omar Suleiman. I do say he has because he gave you a free pass. Yeah, he, he did. I, to forgive you until the day of judgment. Yeah, I do say things like he's tall and you know he, he when he when he goes to an event with me nobody takes a picture with me. <laughs> you know, it's hard to get you guys both in the same picture. It's no way, like you know. And then once he came to um to Michigan, and then he posted a, a picture of me with him. Guess what he did? Do you know this one? May Allah forgive him. Mm. I'm having a hard time forgiving him. Like personally, like it's just, it's gonna it's gonna require some um, therapy uh, at the expense of Yaqeen. But uh, it was he uh, took a picture with me and he was posting it on his Instagram. And I was like, this guy's gonna post on Instagram. He's gonna tag me. I'm gonna have millions of followers the next morning. And he does put the SpongeBob face covering my face. Oh, he put a SpongeBob on my face. Now and he put it on Instagram. Put it on Instagram. Ouch. You know, and you you can forgive a lot of people, but this is but that is a testament to how big of a heart he knows you have. No, of course I love it. You're so good. You flipped it. You flipped it. <laughs> I'm serious though, for sure. Don't no, doubt in my mind. No, 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 it's, so that that's that with the exception of that, usually this is what we talk about. You know, this is our questions, these are uh, okay. challenges and um, and a few weeks, a few months ago, we, we were in, in Detroit. We had, uh, you came earlier. I think this was when the, 
the one of the courses was going on. You did a class for your niftah last the intensive, year. Correct. The intensive, doing the, uh, in the hadith intensive. You came. We spoke then, and honestly, you know, sometimes people think like, oh, the audience is benefiting. I benefit when I sit with people I like do you. As well. No, I benefit so much. You know, I was Omar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. So, لولا ثلاث if it wasn't for these three things, I don't really have a reason to breathe. And I would be, rather be in God's company in Akhirah. He says, If it wasn't for like the feeling that I have of putting my head on the ground, the dirt, you know, being pressed on my forehead, that feeling that I have keeps me one, alive. I like that. I look forward to living. The second reason he says, uh, if it wasn't for the extreme joy that I have in traveling the path of Allah, spreading Islam, sacrificing. And number three, he said, He said, you know, I, the, the fact that I can sit with people, knowledgeable people like you, and, and, and just reap the opportunity, just like literally digest the, the beautiful fruits and gems that are being shared in Umar bin Khattab. That was his purpose of life. And honestly, I, I can share some fraction of his sentiment because, the, you know, when we talk about ladha, like, oh, you see a new dress, you see a new phone, you see a new car, like, wow, it's 2022 BMW, like a new new frame, new body, new lights. Something with knowledge and something about Quran and Sunnah and Deen. You coded that Ibn, Ibn Abbas statement right now. How many things that we saw we stayed silent, and that made him cry. That's, that's, that's such a such a profound statement. And then he quoted that Fulib ibn Ayyad statement. You know, like how, like, um, you know, may Allah forgive him. And you know, like the way he po the positive, and that sister that he quoted that said that we've heard so many praises. Um, um, people, we've heard so many people praise us. What if, what if few people, you know, they do the opposite? These type of things, you know. There was nothing like the first communities. We don't we don't just believe they were superior because the Prophet said uh, the best of generations is mine and those after them, those after them. It, though that would have been enough, of course. If he would have said it, it would have been enough. But if you actually that's my advice to everyone. You live with their sort of biographies and their you know aphorisms and it's Quran and Sunnah, but it's not, right? Like yeah. they they internalize so much of Quran and Sunnah that their lifestyles were so much Qur'an and Sunnah, their gems were so much Qur'an and Sunnah, the more you sort of immerse yourself in their lives and their biographies, that is that thing, right? Yeah. A snapshot of sort of, you know, the best and the earliest, the purest and the finest. And the totally. imperfect. But how do you sort of straddle the imperfection of the human experience with the perfection of Islam? Nothing more inspiring for me than them. And you just reading that life, just... May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us more ability to... Uh, you know, benefit from Sheikh Muhammad Shannawi and also the knowledge and exactly what he said, the, the lives of the pious scholars, especially the Sahaba of the Allah May Allah subhanahu make us people who are very calculated, especially when we speak, you know, we audit ourselves evening in the morning, though, you know, because breaking someone's heart and ruining someone's reputation is probably one of the greatest things someone can do. You know, the Prophet says, whoever stands up to defend the honor of someone when they're being literally attacked, it is becomes a right of, of, upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them and free them from the fire of hell. Like if someone speaks up against someone that is pure, alhamdulillah, innocent, and you just say vocalize and two people just clarify it. It's like, no, I'm not like that. You guys totally got it wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you from the fire of hell. He loves that. So it's important that we never want to be on the side of where we're oppressing people, saying things. You know, I, I honestly feel like you were talking about, you know, like physical abuse and like, like and verbal abuse. We talked about that as a joke on the side. Really, jokes aside, verbal, psychological, emotional abuse is, I think it's, God, it's more painful than physical. You know, like, what 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 can we do to like people in the, in America like people think because there's no like judgment for it like you just you know there's defamation cases and stuff like that like people are doing this all the time no one's gonna come sue you because they don't have the money and time to this like but, the concept of respect and honor sort of uh, dwindled in our age dwindled because if the human being is basically uh, an evolved animal then the 
concept of something abstract like respect and honor and dignity become questionable. Like, what does that even mean? Everything is sort of interpreted in the physical and the tangible. So yeah, it, now you see it, right? There's no such thing as honor, no such thing as dignity, sanctity of human reputation. It is very obscure. Defamation is actually something uh, very weird. If you actually look at the legal definition of it, when you can actually hold someone against it, it's very odd. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I don't plan to do it, but it's, uh, it's almost I almost impossible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on the right path. Mm -hmm. I, again, if the audience was joining, we have over 2,000 2, people joining. Nobody joins. Oh that, that type of audience never joins when I come on with someone else. You, something about you. Oh, yes, and so tell us and tell the audience what's your plan when you're going back home. <laughs> Why? We want to know. We might follow you. <laughs> that's a trick one. Right? So I get some sleep tonight. I'll be heading home in a day or two. Yeah. Dude, that's a curveball. You didn't expect yeah, that, right? No, no. You know, I'm how's... expecting that like two thirds of them are across the ocean. So. And, and, and how's, how far is Allentown? Like, how far is your drive? Tell About us. 10, 11 hours. From being... 10, 11 hours. That's 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 a soldier. Much no, hard. no. I plan on seeing some nature. And... You like nature? Yeah. Wow. I used to. Then it was just so you got bit by a tick or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, beautiful. Pennsylvania is beautiful. The whole drive is going to be beautiful. Inshallah, may Allah take you safe. I mean, no. and keep you. It's like all the Muslims that I are mean, watching so, and I, use them for faith. I told you, Akumullah Dina, Akumullah Manat, Akumullah Khatim. Amalakum, everybody, Jazakumullah Khair. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep us in your prayers. We'll see you guys all next Friday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.